about temptation at checkout, the food industry's sneaky strategy for selling more. I can't tell you how excited I am to introduce our speaker today. Um, I'm lucky enough to work with Jessica Almy, who has done a terrific job researching the report that we released yesterday about checkout. This is um, the next phase of CSPI's work to try to get soda and candy and other junk food out of the checkout. Jessica's going to tell us a little bit about the background research, some of our policy priorities going forward. And if you have questions at any time during the webinar, you can type them into the question box. And then for those of you in the Food Marketing Work Group or the National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity, you should have also gotten a call-in number, and we'll have a discussion where we'll be able to talk to each other um, at 2.45. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Margo, and thank you to all of the participants for joining us for this webinar. We're really excited about this new report, Temptation at Checkout, and we're really happy to see that the response has been so positive. So thank you for taking time out of your very busy day to join us and think deeply about Checkout. I want to start um, by acknowledging our funders. We've received funding support from Voices for Healthy Kids and the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, so just a quick note of thanks to them. Um, so here's what we're going to cover in the next 45 minutes. We have a lot of ground to, to cover. Um, we're going to talk very briefly about the Center for Science and the Public Interest and why we should think about Checkout, and then talk about Checkout as a powerful marketing strategy and why people um, give in to Checkout. So why are they vulnerable by the time they get to the Checkout? And then we're going to shift our focus to how we can use Checkout to support public health rather than undermine it. And we're going to go through some case studies of healthy Checkout projects across the country country and also in the United Kingdom. And finally, we'll end with what you can do to support Healthy Checkout. So please also note on the left-hand side of the screen some um, technical considerations about today's webinar. So many of you on the webinar are familiar with the Center for Science and the Public Interest. It's um, Since 1971, CSPI has worked uh, as a champion for healthy and safe food and for food environments that support people's health. Um, we do this through educating the public through the Nutrition Action Health Letter, which is a monthly magazine, through press, books, reports like the one we're talking about today, and by supporting national, state, and local policy that's, that promote health. Key nutrition policy issues at CSPI extend beyond checkout, of course. Um, so CSPI has really been part of the good food movement. Uh, we've worked to improve and defend school lunch and school breakfast programs, um, strong nutrition standards for competitive foods in schools. We've worked to support menu labeling so that consumers have information about the foods that they are buying in um, restaurant settings. We've worked to improve the health of public property, so that's everything from your local park um, to your municipal building or your city hall. We work on food marketing to kids to try to protect them from marketing for the least healthy foods out there on TV, um, on package use of characters to market foods to kids, and of course in school. And we also work to improve children's restaurant meals, um, which are of course a form of marketing particular foods to kids as kids meals and today we're going to talk about checkout. So why think about checkout? Um, food is everywhere. There are now 3,900 calories available for each person each day in the United States. Of course that's about double what most of us need to um, be healthy. And a 2009 study found that excluding food stores like grocery stores, convenience stores, liquor stores, and restaurants, 41% of commercial establishments either display or sell food. Almost all pharmacies and gas stations, but more than half of auto repair shops too, and more than one third of banks, hotels, and salons. Um, and it's with all of this food everywhere, it's uh, less expensive to consume now than it has been in the past. Now in America, about 10% of income is spent on food versus in the 1970s when it was 14%. And that's a pretty amazing drop considering that we eat out more now than we did in the past. All of this food everywhere um, creates what we call marketing-induced hunger. 
We don't need marketing to know we're hungry, of course, but food companies spend $33 billion each year on marketing to get us to buy and eat specific foods and beverages. And of course, people make different choices based on what's available to them. In one study, um, researchers gave uh, restaurant goers different menus at Subway sandwich shops at lunchtime. People receive short menus uh, highlighting certain choices, and the people who received the short menu highlighting the lowest calorie sandwiches were 48% more likely to choose a low calorie sandwich than those who had received a mixed menu. Likewise, serving adults small portions of broccoli, carrots, and peas rather than a larger portion of a single vegetable increases vegetable consumption by half of the serving. Of course, the complex, uh, the problem of obesity is complex. There's not just a single cause of obesity. However, an occasional checkout purchase could easily contribute to the hundred or so calories per day that are believed to be responsible for the obesity crisis. Uh, when food company researchers interviewed shoppers, 60% said they bought candy and 45% said they bought soda from checkout in the past six months. When you consider a Snickers bar is 250 calories and a, two, a 20 ounce Coke is 200 140 calories, you can see how this could add up over time. In fact, people spend $2.3 billion on beverages and candy that they pick up from supermarket checkouts each year. Overall sales from checkout are about double that at $5.5 billion. But we can't keep on eating the way we do as Americans. Poor diets, of course, contribute to premature death, but also disability, and they drive health care costs. Um, the American diet needs more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, but instead Americans are eating products rich in saturated fat and added sugars, and those are exactly the same foods that are being pushed on us at checkout. Um, snacking, of course, is not always offset by consumption at meals, and so just because you have a snack doesn't mean you will eat a smaller dinner later in the day. Um, and supermarkets sell most of the snacks in adults' diets, and they are the primary source of empty calories for kids. Kids get 436 more empty calories from stores than from fast food restaurants and schools. And sugary drinks are the big, biggest single source of calories and added sugars for both adults and children. Candy and chips also rank among the top 25 sources of calories in the American diet. 90% of American adults snack regularly. They average one or two snacks per day. But adults who eat much more than that, who eat four or more servings of snacks per day, um, consume almost 50% more calories than those who don't snack at all. In a 2010 study of 2,800 adults in California and Louisiana, salty junk food, candy, and soda contribute hundreds of calories a day to the diet, ranging from 386 calories for women in California to 725 calories for men in Los Angeles. And most kids snack daily too. On average, they consume two snacks per day. For kids ages 12 to 19, they consume an average of 526 calories uh, a day from snacks. So given those problems, what can be done? There is no neutral. This is the floor plan of a supermarket. Supermarkets use floor plans like this to determine which products are purchased most frequently, which show up as the red diamonds on this floor plan, or to map the flow of traffic in the supermarket. Some places in the store themselves drive purchases, like the displays closest to the doors, those three uh, rectangles in the lower right corner. Um, put anything in that place and it will sell. So. A random assortment of products throughout the store wouldn't be efficient, so we have to ask what influences which products stores favor through preferential placement in their, in their store settings. Um, when we make food decisions, we're the ones making the decisions, but we are influenced by other factors such as the layout of the stores in which we shop. So we need to be specific that it's food and beverage companies that are shaping our decisions, our food choices, sometimes without us knowing. Their marketing strategies are designed to advance their interests and maximize their gains. Checkout is a powerful marketing strategy. It's one of the locations in the store most likely to prompt purchase, and it's eight times as profitable as other parts of the store. So there's been a significant shift over time in how food companies are spending their food marketing budgets. If you look at these two graphs, you see how they spent their money in 1968 versus how they spent in 2013. And in-store marketing can 
and it contains a lot of different things. It contains the signs, tags, and store coupons in the store. But most importantly, it includes uh, fees for placement. Placement fees, which are sometimes called slotting fees, promotional fees, staying fees, pay to stay, free fill, display fees, or trade promotions, influence which products are located where in the store. If you've read the book Salt, Sugar, Fat by Michael Moss, you may recall that one of the um, convenience store owners that he interviewed wanted to improve his customer's health by offering bananas at the front of his convenience store. But he complained that he couldn't keep the bananas stocked because the soda company um, employees claimed the front of his store as their own space. And that's because of placement fees. The American Antitrust Institute estimates that placement fees are the second largest expense for some food manufacturers after the cost of producing goods. And why do they pay for this space? Because placement increases the likelihood of purchase. Checkout purchases don't displace purchases from elsewhere in the store. Much like snacking supplements what people eat at uh, at mealtimes, checkout purchases supplement what they buy elsewhere in the store. People who buy things at checkout spend more than they otherwise would. In fact, Australian researchers found that customers who buy soda and candy at checkout are often the same ones who avoid candy and soda in the main aisles of the store. Now there's a myth that you should shop the edges of the store if you want to be healthy, but the perimeter of the store is actually where most shopping activity occurs nonetheless, and it includes the checkouts. We need to be mindful about using uh, that shorthand. Michael Moss in his book, Salt, Sugar, Fat, describes a Coca-Cola study where um, Coca-Cola described the center of the store as the dead zone. These companies are very anxious to get their, their products out of the center store and onto the edges in order to get more consumers to buy. In one study of 40 stores, um, researchers found that more chips, candy, cookies, and sugary drinks the more they were promoted at checkout, the lower the percentage of shoppers um, the spent, uh, lower percentage of food bills shoppers spent on fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. So if there were more chips, candy, and cookies and sugar drinks at checkout, the shoppers in those stores were spending less on fruits and vegetables. And sales respond to shelf space. So it's not just that there's placement at checkout, but it's also increased um, shelf space for those particular products. Increasing the shelf space for a product has a promotional effect, causing people to buy more, and it can also affect social norms about what is acceptable to eat and what makes it for a good snack. So this is a problem from a public health perspective because people are vulnerable by the time they get to check out. The average store has 30 to 50,000 items. People typically buy only 30, 300 to 400 of those products per year. So they have to make a lot of decisions in navigating through all of the other items that are in the store. And the more decisions we make, we know, the more likely we're, we are to make choices that are against our own self-interest. Who are most vulnerable? People who have been dieting have stronger physiological responses to the sight and smell of food and are more likely to overeat in response to food cues. People living in poverty have a harder time resisting temptation after they've made economic decisions like shopping. Adolescents are more susceptible to impulse and more motivated by immediate rewards. And perfectionists, people under the influence of alcohol, and people suffering sleep deprivation are all vulnerable too. But no one is immune. Self-control is like a muscle that fatigues with use. And um, decision fatigue happens to the best of us. A 2011 study of 1,100 judicial decisions found that judges who were deciding parole started granting parole 65% of the time at the beginning of their day. And as the day went on, they were less and less likely to grant parole. So much so that it, the percentage went down to nearly zero by the time they reached lunchtime. And then after the judges had taken a break, the number of uh, paroles that were granted went back up to about 65%, just like at the beginning of the day. And the researchers found that the time that the judges had spent since their last break was statistically significant in determining whether the prisoners before them were going to get parole. In fact, it was significant when other important factors such as the severity of crime for which the prisoners had been convicted and the amount of time served were not statistically significant. And of course, um, willpower reserves are 
a lot like making decisions. So the more we have to use our willpower, the more likely it is to fatigue. Temptation is one of the reasons that education alone won't work. You're not going to stop buying candy or soda from checkout because you've listened to this webinar, I regret to tell you. Um, the reason that temptation works at checkout is that it's a conflict between our rational mind and the part of our mind that either um, regulates our habits or seeks pleasures. Just because we know the right answer um, when we're faced with temptation at checkout doesn't mean that we can bring ourselves to choose it. Many people on this uh, webinar are probably familiar with the marshmallow studies of the late 1960s and early 1970s. And if you're not, you can go to Wikipedia and look at the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment. That's the title they have on Wikipedia for these studies. In the studies, researchers gave children the opportunity to choose among various treats. And then the kids were given one of the treats with instructions that they would get a second treat if they could wait until the researcher came back. Now keep in mind, these are these kids. They preferred treats out of all of the options, in many cases marshmallows. The kids were given a bell to ring if they wanted the researcher to return, but they were warned if they rang the bell, there would be no second marshmallow or second treat. On average, kids couldn't make it. They waited only three minutes before ringing the bell, which goes to show that even if you know you're going to get a second treat, you can't bring yourself to wait. And it's not just kids. Adults, too, have problems with temptation and willpower. Um, all of us know that it's important to save for retirement, but 30% of workers never have saved. The problem with checkout is that it's not just an occasional temptation. American households shop for food 1.7 times a week. And it's not just food stores that have candy and soda at checkout. Um, in fact, candy and soda are at checkout everywhere, at Bed Bath & Beyond, Home Depot, and many other non-food stores. Um, and, and it's not just adults who are targeted either. Um, it, convenience stores in St. Paul and Minneapolis Every one of 63 stores within a half mile of high school sold candy, gum, chips, and soda at checkout, whereas fewer than half sold healthier foods like nuts, seeds, fruit, water, and granola bars. And of course, when we're waiting at checkout, we're waiting, often for three to five minutes. And during that time, we're affected by in-store marketing and placement, especially when products are positioned to attract the attention of adults or children. And you simply can't avoid checkout. Even self-checkout is merchandise now with candy, soda, and other junk foods. In fact, candy takes up 180 linear feet at the average grocery store. And that's the equivalent of two blue whales, uh, tail to tail. And of course, the food offerings at checkout are unhealthy. The data that you see on the screen right now are from CSPI's study last summer, in which we looked at chain stores in the Washington, D.C. area, and we measured the number of candy, gum, energy bar, chip facings for each checkout. So you can see that in our study, we found that 90% of the offerings were unhealthy. 8% were what we determined was healthier, and only 2% were healthy. We actually had a category for vegetables, but didn't find vegetables at any checkout in any of the stores that we examined. Bridging the Gap has another study that's coming out very soon in which they examined 8,617 stores, including supermarkets, drug stores, convenience stores, and dollar stores. And they found that 88% of those stores display candy at checkout. And the beverage offerings are not much better. In the CSPI study, we found that 60% of the beverage offerings at checkout in both food and non-food stores were sugar-sweetened beverages, whereas fewer than 20% were water. In Bridging the Gap, they also found that um, stores are more likely to sell sugary drinks than water at checkout. Checkout creates unhealthy norms for kids. According to the Federal Trade Commission, 75% of purchasers surveyed reported that they bought a product for the first time because children requested it. Parents are incredibly resilient to children's requests. In one study, parents said no for three times they said yes. In another study, some mothers said no as many as nine times for every time that they said yes. But in-store marketing can induce conflict between parents and their children. With funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, CSPI conducted focus groups of mothers across the country. And one mom in San Francisco told us that she disliked checkout because it's, frust quote, it's frustrating that we have to fight. Another mother in Phoenix had this to say, well, it upsets me just because I want to make my kids happy. 
Me, personally, as a single mom working outside of the home, I have only so many hours with my children, and it's unhealthy foods they want. You want to give it to them. Plus, kids are not always with their parents. Kids can buy foods independently, particularly once they get to middle school. In 2009 study of 4th, 5th, and 6th graders purchases at urban corner stores, researchers found that the kids most often purchased chips and candy, and that 84% of their beverages that they purchased were sugar-sweetened beverages. But it doesn't need to be this way. Changing how choices are offered can encourage positive outcomes. Um, this is a clip from our supermarket video, and we'll share the URL at the end of the webinar, but if you haven't seen it already, I urge you to see it. Um, Margot Rutan, who gave the introduction today, um, gives a very interesting short talk on how um, supermarket decisions are influenced. So nudges can support public health. Um, changing the layout of cafeteria food can encourage people to make healthier choices while keeping, leaving them with the ability to make a choice. Designing buildings so that stairs come before elevators gets more people to walk the stairs. And displaying photos of salads in cafeterias can reduce consumption of desserts. This works also in supermarkets. In one supermarket experiment, um, researchers put floor arrows pointing to the produce section and shopping carts with placards stating that the average customer bought five fruits and vegetables. And they also listed what the most popular pro produce items were. And this effectively increased the purchase of fruits and vegetables among shoppers. And the change was most pronounced among participants in WIC. Companies can also lead the way. In recent years, Disney changed the default beverages in its parks to 100% juice, water, and low-fat milk. And Disney now offers fruits and vegetables as the default side dishes for children's meals in Disney parks. Two-thirds of families stick with these defaults, even though they could opt for other choices. Another great example comes from the workplace. Um, so Google has a policy that all of its employees must stay within a certain distance of snacks. It's, a, it's supposed to boost um, employee morale. But they found that their employees were eating a lot of snacks. So they tried putting out healthy snacks like pistachios and dried fruit in either clear containers or clearly viewable containers. And then they um, put the other containers, uh, the other snacks like M&Ms in opaque containers like the one they show here. And um, both kinds of snacks remained available, but one was highly visible and the other one was, was hidden away. And they were able to curb the consumption in their offices by 3.1 million calories over seven weeks. That's the equivalent of nine packs of M&Ms per employee um, just by changing how the options were displayed. So checkout can be an opportunity to support help. In CSPI study, we found that 47% of checkout offerings were non-food merchandise, everything from gift cards and personal care items um, to gift wrap and greeting cards and umbrellas and gloves, all sorts of stuff was sold at checkout. These things can be great impulse buys that don't um, cause obesity or diabetes. And um, there are other examples of healthy checkout from across the country. Um, our report goes into case studies of healthy checkout projects where um, advocates in communities have piloted a healthy checkout aisle to see how if they can boost um, consumption of fruits and vegetables over candy and soda. And we profile a number of these healthy checkout pilots across the United States. Um, in Shasta County, California, for example, Middle schoolers worked with their local health department to get their Walmart in their community to offer a healthy checkout aisle, and it was so popular that the idea spread to other Walmarts in the area. In West Virginia, Change the Future West Virginia has worked with more than 50 stores to get healthy checkout aisles into their stores, and they've overcome challenges um, such as getting the local health department sign off by offering tongs to pick up. Uh, single pieces of fruit, for example. And when I interviewed one of the advocates at Change the Future West Virginia, she told me a fantastic story about the first day a healthy, healthy checkout pilot went into a store. Um, she was in line, and she heard two little kids behind her ask their dad for a banana. But it's not just West Virginia and California. You, you can see from this map, it's all across the country. In Utah, the chain Harmons offers flashcards, crayons, water bottles, and travel mugs, as well as healthy food choices in their healthy checkout aisles. Um, 
in California, the Public Health Institute has worked to get Healthy Checkout. In Indiana, Wellborn Baptist Foundation has worked on Healthy Checkout. The Douglas County Health Department in Nebraska has taken on these projects. Researchers in Maryland have researched Healthy Checkout. And other places with Healthy Checkout include New York City, North Carolina, Virginia, Wisconsin, Ohio, and Oregon. And companies are also taking the lead on some of these projects. Hy-Vee has healthy checkout aisles in um, all of their stores, one or two aisles per store, and they have healthier products like 100 calorie packs. Love's Travel Stops um, offers fruit because they had the demand of the truckers who would ask them for healthier choices at checkout. And in a commitment with the Partnership for Healthier America, the convenience store Sheets has committed that all new stores will have 10 healthier options within three feet of the cash registers. But I think the most inspiring examples come from across the pond. If we look at the United Kingdom, we've seen in the past year and a half, three major retailers have gotten rid of candy at checkout. And this isn't one checkout aisle or a pilot project, but rather all candy from all of their checkout aisles in all of their stores. And they replaced it with healthier options, like you can see in this center photo. This is a photo from Little, which is a discount retailer in the United Kingdom. And they have to sell apples, they sell tea you can brew at home, they sell dried fruit um, in their checkouts, and they found that they've improved the health of the offerings that they're the health of the they've improved the nutritional quality of the products that people are buying at a checkout, and Little was the first, but Tesco and Aldi have also joined them in getting rid of all candy and all checkout aisles in all of their stores. So where do we go from here? After all of this that I've talked to you about today, are we asking you to give up buying candy at checkout? Bad chance. But I think it is time to challenge business as usual. Um, so our report recommends that uh, advocates and consumers contact re retailers in the communities to ask that they remove food or offer healthy options at checkout. This is an example from Models, which has all non-food options at checkout. Models is a sporting goods store, so they've got baseball cards and flip-flops and uh, locker or locks for your locker. Uh, we also recommend that people ask soda, candy, and snack manufacturers only to sell healthier options at checkout and to urge your elected officials to support checkout policies. Our report has additional recommendations for retailers, food and beverage companies, and government and other institutions, which include voluntary measures to get rid of food at checkout or implement nutrition standards for the foods and beverages that are offered at checkout in stores or property that they manage, or to agree not to pay for placement of low nutrition foods in checkout or to add checkout to their pledges under the Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative, which um, is a self-regulatory program for limiting food marketing to children. CSPI stands ready to help you um, if you want to spearhead a checkout campaign in your community. We will support corporate campaigns or public policy campaigns. And here are a few of the resources that we have available. We have the report that came out this week, Temptation at Checkout, the Food Industry Sneaky Strategy for Selling More. We have Model Nutrition Standards, and we have a whiteboard lecture on supermarket marketing techniques, all available at the URL that's shown on your screen, cspinet.org slash healthy checkout. And coming soon, our partners at Change Lab Solutions will have a model checkout policy for communities that want to introduce a bill. We also launched a campaign this week to ask Bed Bath & Beyond to get rid of candy at checkout. We're certainly not going to stop with Bed Bath & Beyond, but we think it's a good place to start. What is a home goods store doing selling candy in giant mountains like you see on your screen at checkout? So we ask you to join us in that campaign and add your name by going to cspinet.org slash act now. And with that, here's my contact information. Again, I'm Jessica Almy. I work for the Center for Science and the Public Interest. And I urge you to get in touch with us if you want to um, be a leader in the campaign for healthier checkouts. And I will uh, take your questions now. Great. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was terrific um, and very exciting to kick off this work and inspiring to see what folks are doing 
in the UK. Um, we have one comment from Sabrina Adler at Change Lab Solutions just saying that actually their model policy is now ready. And so we can um, share the URL and we'll add that to our website um, that Jessica just said at tspanet.org slash healthy checkout. We'll add a link to that policy or you can go um, to Change Lab Solutions website. So, um, so let's go to a few questions. We have a little bit of, of time for discussion. Jessica, why don't we start off by just talking generally about marketing. When most people think of marketing, they think about ads and promotions. Can you talk a little bit more about how checkout is actually marketing? a great question. So um, when most people think about marketing, they do think about things like television ads and magazine ads or ads on the radio, and those are forms of marketing. They're what we refer to as promotion. But our report lays out the four ways that, uh, what they call the four P's of marketing, uh, which go beyond just promotion. So promotion includes, of course, those kinds of traditional advertising as well as internet, advertising and in-store signs and the use of social media and advert games. But the product uh, there are other forms of advertising or marketing product, price, and placement. So product can be the uh, design of a product so that it markets itself in the supermarket. So for example, a formulation of a particular product um, can induce consumption, and I think David Kessler has written really eloquently about this, about how formulations of salt, sugar, and fat can combine to stimulate the appetite and, and uh, serve as a form of marketing for particular products. Um, Another example of how the composition of a product can be a form of marketing is uh, Lunchables. So uh, kids, you know, think of these pieces of meat and cheese and crackers as a, a lunch meal um, just because of how it's been bundled together as a single product. And also uh, under product is package design, so that includes the shape, size, and font on the package. And um, some people think that package design is one of the most form uh, powerful forms of marketing just because of the sheer exposure. You know, every time you pass by a package in the supermarket, you're exposed to marketing for that particular product. Um, price can also be a form of marketing. So most shoppers look for low prices, but higher prices can signal quality. Um, coupons are another way that price can be used to market particular foods. But the real focus of our report and the focus of our checkout campaign is placement as a form of marketing. So it's uh, probably the most subtle of the food marketing techniques, but it's also very pervasive. So um, food companies manipulate consumer behavior by making deals with retailers to put their foods and beverages in places in the store that will boost their sales. So that could be the amount of shelf space that's allocated to a particular food. It could be cross promotions, like you would find um, marshmallows and graham crackers and chocolates all displayed together in a s'mores display. Um, it could be putting products in the pathway of consumers. So, um, for example, in a convenience store, you might have a candy display on your way to the beverage cooler. And then, um, the, of course, middle shelf or checkout or other places in the supermarket that are known to prompt purchase just because of how uh, visible those places are. That's another form of uh, placement as marketing. And of course, checkout is, is, we think, one of the most powerful places in the supermarket. And so food manufacturers pay dearly to put their products there. And it works. People buy things at checkout simply because they're checkout. They're not going to be on people's list. And in some cases, it's going to be the very same things that they've avoided elsewhere in the store. But they're tired, they've made a lot of decisions, they're fatigued, their willpower is worn out, and gosh darn, that chocolate bar looks so good, but often they'll grab for it, and then if they justify the decision at all, it's often after, after that motion has already been put in place. So placement is a very powerful form of food marketing, particularly in retail stores. Well, we in public health will want lots of studies to prove that, yet yesterday while I was waiting to get my cup of tea at Starbucks, a new employee was being trained and the manager was talking about the impulse items and it's just a given that those things are going to sell more. Um, so a lot to learn from what the industry already knows and the practices that they have found to be effective. Um, so we have another question about what's motivating 
the stores in the UK like Tesco to take the junk food out of the checkout? Do purveyors of healthy food offer placement fees to incentivize healthier food options at checkout? Jessica, are you there? Sorry about that. So I'll answer that in two parts. The first answer is that it's consumer demand that has driven the checkout changes in checkout in the United Kingdom. Um, so the Children's Food Campaign is a public health organization in the United Kingdom that has been pushing retailers to improve the health of checkout for a very long time. And the retailers for a while had made some voluntary promises about removing chocolates from checkout, um, but they weren't keeping their promises. And so just in the past couple of years, the Children's Food Campaign has mounted a major campaign to get these retailers to drop candy from the checkout. But the retailers have found that the, um, the their, their customers want it too. So um, Little had tried, there was the first of these uh, companies that dropped candy from all checkout aisles in all of their stores. And they tried a pilot project first where they had a single candy-free checkout aisle in each of their store. And, but, and they documented the appeal and popularity of the aisle. Those checkouts received 20% higher footfall than the candy aisles. And Little surveyed its customers and found strong support for the candy-free aisles. So as a result of that, they decided to eliminate candy from all of their checkout aisles. And this was a decision that was heralded not only by the children's food campaign, but also by a public health minister. And it really has risen to an issue of national debate in the United Kingdom where it's being discussed on their equivalent of NPR, whether or not there should be candy at checkout. And since Little um, started uh, this candy-free checkout in all of their stores, Tesco and Aldi have followed suit. But I guess the second part to the answer is that um, the United Kingdom doesn't have the same kind of um, financial relationships between retailers and manufacturers that we have in the United States. So I don't think that Little is being paid placement fees by uh, Apple growers or um, tea companies. I think that uh, they are responding to consumer demand, and if um, United States stores listen to their consumers, we probably have candy and tea as well. Great. Um, our next question is about how can someone go about working on healthy checkout? Should they work with the corporate offices, the local store managers and franchisers, or both? That's a great question. Well, we'd love to work with you here at CSPI on that checkout campaign. I think that the um, you know, the answer is both. I think that store managers need to be hearing from their customers that they want healthy checkout, that they're sick of candy and soda, and that doesn't appeal to their customers. Um, but I also think that corporate headquarters need to be hearing from customers and from public health organizations that want healthy checkout. And so I, th I really think it's kind of a dual approach is what's needed. Um, you know, in the United Kingdom, one of the things that they did was have customers hand cards to their cashiers asking for them to get rid of the candy at checkout. Um, here in, in our campaign to Bed Bath & Beyond, we're sending tweets to Bed Bath & Beyond headquarters. So I think a dual approach is probably most powerful. But I'd be happy to talk to um, folks who are on the webinar about what the best approach is for the particular chain that you're interested in changing and who we can partner um, with to really bring about significant change. I think it's going to be different if you're talking about a small chain of three to five grocery stores in the community versus um, a big national chain like Walmart. Great, and that's a good reminder that people can be active on this campaign immediately if you go to CSPI's Twitter page at CSPI, you can tweet at Bed Bath & Beyond today and encourage them to get junk out of the checkout. And that's actually yeah, great. Two re oh, go ahead. I was going to say, and also we should invite people to join our uh, tweet chat tomorrow at 1 o'clock Eastern. Uh, we're going to be using the hashtag RethinkCheckout, and you're welcome to use that hashtag RethinkCheckout between now and then or any time after to try to encourage retailers to improve their checkout policies. 
We have two questions about revenue and what the financial impact of getting junk food out of the checkout is on retailers. Um, they're asked a little bit differently, but you know, is there any information about increases and decreases in revenue? Um, and are companies reluctant to make changes to checkout because of concerns about profit? Well, it's a little bit difficult to get to the bottom of profit because, of course, um, food retailers are companies who closely guard their financial information, for starters. And secondly, uh, even if they were completely transparent, it's hard to tell where a product comes from in the store, uh, whether it's a single-serve candy bar that was purchased from the candy aisle near the back of the store, or whether it was purchased at the front of the store, or in for our purposes, a banana that was purchased from the produce department or from a healthy checkout aisle. So it's really difficult to get to the bottom of that. What we do know is that anecdotally, um, you know, healthy checkout aisles have been successful. They have persisted in communities and in stores even after the initial clamor for them has died down. And I think that, spe that speaks to their success. Um, just putting something at checkout certainly boosts its uh, sales. In fact, when I was talking to a dietitian at Harmons, which is a store that has a healthy checkout aisle in each of their uh, grocery stores, she told me there was a brand of hand sanitizer that was being discontinued from the center of the store because it wasn't selling well. But they tried it out in the healthy checkout aisle, and the sales were good enough that they kept that product and started selling it at the checkout aisle. Um, so certainly putting anything in checkout is going to boost to sales. Uh, we also have some data from the industry about what percentage of aisles have particular products and we know that even though healthy products like water and um, small packets of seeds and nuts are not merchandised as strongly as things like candy and soda are, they still sell very well in checkout um, and certainly we see that with non-food merchandise as well. There's a reason that there are gift cards at most checkouts and that's because uh, they sell. Question about, are there any state or national policies in place that address checkout or placement policies, or is this up to the individual retailer? So right now, we don't have a federal policy on checkout. Um, our report makes recommendations for policies that should be adopted at our state and local level. We also um, call on the children's food and beverage advertising initiative to add healthy checkout to its self-regulation um, program. And we call on the Federal Trade Commission and state attorneys general to use their subpoena power to assess the use of placement fees to promote particular foods and beverages. But really, we're at the beginning of this uh, initiative. And, and I think it's going to be a combination of companies doing the right thing because they're being asked by customers, and also um, states and, and localities passing policies requiring that checkout be healthy. So right now, the answer is no, we've got nothing at the federal level, but um, we're just now starting. So I hope that everyone on this webinar will, will join with us and, and work toward a healthier checkout. And so we just have about two minutes. There was one other comment about CVS. They've gotten rid of tobacco products. Should checkout be next? Absolutely, checkout should be next for CVS and certainly for Walgreens too. What is a drugstore that's uh, you know positioning itself as a purveyor of health doing pushing candy and soda on customers at checkout? If you go to my um, Twitter page, I, I'm at Jessica Almy, and I took a picture at CVS over the weekend. Uh, my local CVS pharmacy counter has candy, so that when you pick up your prescription, you can grab a Snickers bar too. And I think. Um, Certainly, drugstores, pharmacies ought to be doing better. They ought to be promoting people's health, and I think CVS has um, certainly embraced that model in discontinuing tobacco. Despite the fact that tobacco companies pay to place their products there, just the way that candy companies pay to place theirs, and despite the fact that cigarette sales are very lucrative, CVS did the right thing when it came to tobacco, and it's time um, for them to do the same with candy. And I should also add that CVS didn't do this in a vacuum. Um, municipalities were banning tobacco sales at pharmacies in Massachusetts and elsewhere, and it was those policies that were springing up around the country that really kind of laid the groundwork for CVS's decision. So I think 
when we're look to, looking at candy and soda at checkout, we're certainly going to need to take a similar approach where it's going to be a combination of public policy and asking companies to do the right thing to really transform checkout from a place where impulse buys of candy and soda are pushed on consumers to a place where consumers can pick up fun impulse buys that don't harm their health, um, whether they're a banana or a non-food item. Well, Jessica, thank you for a great presentation and for all your hard work on CSPI's new report on checkout. Just one last reminder um, to get involved. You can join the Food Marketing Work Group. You can um, email Jessica. Her email is here and find out more about how to get involved. Or just go to cspinet.org and um, shoot an email to Bed Bath & Beyond today. Or if you're on Twitter, you can tweet at them um, from CSPI's. Twitter feed as well. And thank you, Jessica, for your presentation and to all of you who joined us today. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, everyone.